The offseason is upon us, folks. Baseball had a pretty terrific 2023, full of fresh young faces, exciting rule changes, and unlikely teams going on magical runs. But with the season's end comes an offseason, and a free agency frenzy that could start to catch fire at any given moment. Now, to be honest, this year's class is top-heavy, highlighted by the Shohei Otani sweepstakes, the Cody Bellinger question mark, and the possible mega deals for reliable starting pitchers like Cy Young winner Blake Snell and playoff studs like Jordan Montgomery and Aaron Nola. But the most compelling case, in my opinion, is that of a 25-year-old fireballer from Japan by the name of Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Last year saw the Kodai Senga sweepstakes, the year before saw the Seiya Suzuki bidding war, but the competition for Yamamoto's services may be the fiercest of all. We might be on the verge of seeing the largest contract for a Japanese pitcher ever, with Yamamoto's outlook drawing some elite comparisons to guys like Masahiro Tanaka. So today, let's clear up everything we need to know and whether or not your favorite team is going to come out on the other side with this overseas stud on your roster. If you're not big on Japanese baseball, you may have not heard of this fella before. He made waves in American media with his performance in this year's World Baseball Classic. Yamamoto made two appearances, allowing two runs in seven and a third innings of work, striking out 13 and walking just one batter for Team Japan, the squad that would go on to conquer Team USA in the finals of the tournament. Let's take a look at his track record. For several years now, Yamamoto has been the best pitcher that Japan has to offer. In each of the last three seasons, he's pitched over 160 innings, maintained an ERA well below two, a whip below one, and an extremely favorable strikeout, walk, and home run rate. He lives off soft contact, generates plenty of whiffs, has a deep pitch mix that has continued to evolve and improve, and has shown great durability early on in his young career. In short, he is the best starting pitcher of this year's free agent market by a decent margin in my opinion, and he's got the accolades to show for it as well. The right-hander set the bar high for himself as a teenager with Nippon Professional Baseball's Oryx Buffaloes, pitching to a 2.35 ERA in 57 and a third innings at just 18 years old in 2017. And since his rookie season, he's only gotten better. During that time, he's made five all-star teams, tossed four no-hitters, won two MVP awards, and three Sawamura awards, which is the Japanese equivalent of a Cy Young. He's the fifth pitcher in NPB history to win the award three times, and just the second to do it three years in a row. He's also thrown a no-hitter in each of the last two seasons, the latter coming with Yankees general manager Brian Cashman in the building in Japan. In his time in the NPB, Yamamoto has thrown 897 innings with a 1.82 ERA. There are only two other pitchers in that league's history to exceed 880 innings, with an ERA are similarly well below two in the 70 plus years of the league's existence. One is Kazuhisa Inao, who pitched in the 1950s and 60s. The other is five-time All-Star Yu Darvish, who had a 1.99 ERA before coming over to MLB and pitching at an elite level for the past 11 years, finishing as a Cy Young runner-up in two different seasons. But instead of just reading numbers off a page, let's hear what other industry insiders think of the outlook of Yamamoto and how exactly he's garnering so much success on the mound. Jim Bowden of The Athletic says that during free agency, teams will view Yamamoto as a number one or number two starter option, someone who could step into any rotation and record double-digit wins in an ERA below three. On his arsenal, he says that his fastball lives in the mid to high 90s with a wipeout split finger and a plus curveball as part of a five-pitch mix. So let's dive into this five-pitch mix so we can learn everything about Yamamoto and how he gets all these outs. To do so, I'll be relying on an article out of Just Baseball written by RM Layton, and I highly recommend reading this article after the video. Let's start things off with the heater. According to Fangraphs, the league average fastball velocity from 2023 was 93.8 miles per hour, meaning Yamamoto is already a plus there. Yamamoto touched 99 miles per hour on his fastball during the Japan series this year, a large difference from his average of 95 that he impressed a large audience with during the World Baseball Classic. His smaller frame of 5'10 is actually a bonus for him, as his release point for his pitches is lower than the average pitcher, around 5.4 feet to be exact. This means he can rack up more whiffs on his fastball than a traditional fastball, with his low release, high velocity, and 17 inches of vertical break, playing up to a rising effect. He relied on this pitch heavily, using it about 45% of the time during his most recent season, and most of the time he was living in the zone with this pitch. Listen, if you're a bit scared off by that smaller frame, I get it. But do you know who else was under 6 feet? Some guy named Pedro Martinez, who also featured a devastating fastball that approached 100 miles per hour on occasion. I'm not saying these two are going to be the same guy, I'm saying that height isn't everything here. The main pitch that plays off that really good fastball is his splitter, which he throws 30% of the time, meaning 7 75% of his pitches came in a fastball splitter combo. The intriguing part of his split finger pitch is that when he arrives in MLB, it's likely that he'll be throwing this pitch with a top 5 velocity in the league already, and easily harder than any other starting pitcher in the sport as it currently resides with an average velocity of 90 miles per hour. The only guys who throw this pitch faster on average are high leverage relievers like Yohan Duran and David Bednar. Much like Kodai Senga's ghost fork pitch that would drop off the table with its movement, Yamamoto's splitter comes in 7 miles per hour faster 
on average, which in baseball could easily be the difference between a barrel and a whiff. In Layton's article, he remarks the similarity in the profile of this pitch to Alex Cobb's splitter, which also sits in the 89 to 91 mile per hour range with right around 12 to 13 inches of horizontal movement. For reference, Cobb's splitter was one of the more efficient splitters in baseball. It had a strikeout rate near 20% and held opposing batters to a 239 batting average. This all bodes well for Yamamoto as he'll have a more electric fastball to play with than Cobb. Yamamoto held opposing hitters to just a 170 batting average with a chase rate around 50% on this pitch and a ground ball rate above 75%. This pitch lives pretty much exclusively at the bottom of the zone, but Yamamoto can live in the zone with ease so long as he doesn't leave the pitch up. His tertiary pitch is a looping curveball that sits in the mid to high 70s. Perhaps the most interesting and wary factor of this pitch is how much Yamamoto attacks the zone with it, throwing it for a strike 70% of the time. Most pitchers use a curveball as a chase or waste pitch ahead in the count trying to rack up whiffs, but Yamamoto, so far ahead of his competition at this point, threw his hook with more confidence than ever in 2023. The opposing batter's numbers on his curveball are similar to that of his fastball, a batting average a smidge over 200 with an OPS in the 500s. Of course, this pitch plays well into his ground ball repertoire as well, living low in the zone on most occasions. Being that his main three pitches rely on generating swing and misses or weak contact, his final two pitches also act as accessories to that strategy. His fourth pitch is a cut fastball, a complement to his four-seamer, and targets mostly right-handed hitters, attacking the inside part of the strike zone. He threw this pitch 10% of the time last season, and while it's not ever used as a put-away pitch or whiff generator, it's great for keeping the ball on the ground. He's also leaned into the sweeper phenomenon, taking a lot off his slider to the tune of an average velocity of 84 miles per hour. He featured this a few times in the World Baseball Classic specifically. He does throw this pitch the least by far, but could possibly lean into it more once he comes over to the States. While he almost certainly will remain primarily a fastball splitter combo kind of pitcher, we could see upticks in the usage of his secondary pitches. For those who don't know, hitters are primarily left-handed in Japan, about two of every three batters roughly. In MLB, it's essentially the opposite, meaning Yamamoto could lean on his sweeper and cutter a lot more when he faces more right-handed batters. So that's who Yoshinobu Yamamoto is to this point in his career, but the next stage of his baseball journey will easily be the most legacy-defining as he prepares to play on the biggest stage of his life like many other Japanese players before him. The sweepstakes for his services will certainly be competitive, so let's examine the landscape and try to see who will come out on top. ESPN insider and my commentary co-host Jeff Passan believes Yamamoto will be the second highest paid player of this year's free agency. Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who I think is probably going to get the second most money in free agency this winter. Is... Some may scoff at this notion considering his small frame and lack of experience against MLB caliber hitters, but I think Passan's theory is pretty solid. A way we can analyze it is by drawing the most accurate comparison we have, which is that of Masahiro Tanaka back in 2014. He signed a seven-year, $155 million deal with the New York Yankees, after an undefeated 24-0 season where his Golden Eagles won the Japan Series. He was entering his age 25 season just like Yamamoto, posted career best numbers just like Yamamoto, and in the end, Tanaka was worth every penny. Will the same be said for Yamamoto? Who knows? It's also hard to not draw a lot of similarities to Kodai Senga of the Mets based on his own success in the NPB, as well as the fact that his free agency saga happened just last year. Senga was five years older and drew a five-year $75 million contract from the Mets, which was personally more than I thought he'd get but is now looking like a great contract. Given Yamamoto's proven success, much younger age of 25, unique frame, and a far weaker free agent class to compete with, I think his contract will easily exceed Senga's, both in years and money. It's also difficult not to speculate that the New York Mets won't be a leading contender for Yamamoto's services given the early success of Senga's contract. Senga already revealed that he is actively recruiting Yamamoto to join him in New York as well, calling Yamamoto an amazing player. We all know about the deep pockets of Cohen's, so now it becomes a matter of new GM David Stern's interest and whether or not they'll be the highest bidder. But this isn't just going to be a Mets-led contract contest. Many teams have already made it clear that they are vying to add Yamamoto in a market relatively light on elite starting pitching. Let's go over some of the candidates, and fair warning, there's a lot of them. Both teams in New York, the Mets and the Yankees, are in on Yoshinobu Yamamoto. For the latter, they built a seemingly dominant rotation prior to this season, then saw the regression of Luis Severino in an injury-plagued first year from free agent splash signing Carlos Rodon. They'll need a true number two behind Cy Young winner Garrett 
Garrett Cole, and Yamamoto fits that bill. The St. Louis Cardinals are also looking to spend big this winter. After a crushingly disappointing season, seeing them finish in last place for the first time in 33 years, they're desperate for some starting pitching, with their only current arms in the rotation being recently extended Miles Michaelis, Steven Matz, and some of their young, unproven pitching prospects. The Philadelphia Phillies will also be in the market, always a big spender these days, as they could be in danger of losing Aaron Nola to another team and will be short a starter in that case. They already have a formidable starting rotation, but they're always a threat to spend. One of the biggest contenders from last season, the Los Angeles Dodgers, crumbled in the playoffs due to a weak starting rotation. Having to rely on rookies for most of 2023 is likely going to inspire a want for dominant starting pitching by their front office, so they remain a large threat so long as they're not solely focused on getting Shohei Otani. The San Francisco Giants are in a very similar boat, with money to spend and lots of pitching problems last year. They too will surely be in on Shohei Otani, meaning there could be a war in the West for both of these guys. The Boston Red Sox with Chicago Cubs, Atlanta Braves, and Texas Rangers bear mentioning on this list as well, with all three teams being frequent high spenders in recent years with different levels of recent success. That's 10 teams, a third of the league, that I could realistically see landing Yoshinobu Yamamoto. There's definitely options behind him in free agency, but I think most clubs agree at this point that Yamamoto is the pitcher with the highest upside and longest future of playing ahead of him. So we've got 10 teams here. Let's talk about some factors that could separate these teams in the pack. First and foremost is obviously money and the market of said team. I could see the bidding war approaching the number 200 million pretty easily, and any teams who are scared of that number likely will be tossed to the side. Plus, sponsorship opportunities in places like California, New York, and Boston will certainly be a factor here. With most of his pitch mix reliant on generating whiffs or ground ball contact, Yamamoto might also be inclined to sign with a team that plays great defense, specifically in the infield. Field. For what it's worth, the Cubs and Giants topped MLB teams with a plus 28 value in infield outs above average, while the Red Sox were far and away the worst team in baseball in this category, with a combined value of negative 39 outs above average. It's also been stated that players from Japan are sometimes uncomfortable being teammates with other Japanese players. As Ken Rosenthal wrote for The Athletic earlier in the year, these players value, quote, the importance of seniority in Japan's culture. In theory, this would worsen the chances of teams like the Mets and Red Sox, with Kodai Senga and Mount Sataki Yoshida respectively. Also, any team trying to acquire Shohei Otani as well, like the Dodgers and Giants. However, Yamamoto is reportedly very open-minded when it comes to this topic due to his positive experience in the World Baseball Classic with Team Japan. So what would originally be considered a disadvantage for these teams can be taken as a benefit now. So with all that laid on the table, I think I know my pick. I'm obviously biased, but I think all signs point to Yamamoto landing on either New York team. It's hard to say which one, but I think the Mets and the Yankees are going to be leading the pack here. Here's why I don't think it'll be the other teams. I think the Dodgers and the Giants will be too busy engaging in Shohei Otani's services, and I do think Otani lands with one of those teams. I think Philadelphia will likely bring back Aaron Nola and run it back with the same squad that has made back-to-back -back NLCSs at this point. I think Atlanta is going to shift their focus to trying to extend Max Freed, and they already have a ton of extensions on the books and might not approach that $200 million mark. I think Boston will seek lower cost options, being that they're still in the earlier stages of buying back into contention. I think the Cardinals have too many holes to fill to put all of their chips onto one guy, as they likely need to fill two to three rotation spots. Any one of these reasons could be proven incorrect very soon and make this video age poorly, but I think Yamamoto will be the next big Japanese pitcher of New York, and I'm eager to see how intense the bidding war gets here. This is an extremely talented player, very much deserving of his price tag and speculation, and I believe he's going to make significant waves in 2024 baseball. But that'll do it for my profile on him for now, so if you enjoyed the video, leave a like on the video and subscribe to the Jolly Olive channel. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.